Hello everyone, um, this is Dr. A. We're going to look at the heart disease chapter, chapter 18 of Larson, and we're going to start with a brief review of anatomy. So I'm going to play this video and I will link it below also if you can, if you can see the original. Um, I'm going to start really quick, uh, just even before playing it, quick review of the anatomy. So this is uh, like the dissection, if you will, of the heart. You have your vena cava right here, uh, inferior and superior, and you have your right atrium here with the right ventricle. The valve between the, these two is the atrioventricular valve on the right side, also known as the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps. Um, this is a semilunar valve that opens up to the pulmonary trunk, so the right side of the heart pumps uh, blood that way, and then this goes and brings blood to the lung. And then blood's, blood comes back from the lung through the uh, pulmonary veins here that are connected to the left atria. And then the left atria opens into the left ventricle. This is another atrioventricular valve. This is a bicuspid because it only has two uh, cl clasps, uh, cusps, I'm sorry, two cusps, or also known as the mitral valve. And then when it pumps, it pumps to the, the main the aorta here um, and it's also guarded by a semilunar valve okay so that's a um, quick review this is the septum between it divides the heart into right and left sides um, and the right side is getting blood from the body and pumping it to the lungs the left side is getting blood from the lungs and pumping it to the body okay and so this is just going to show the path of blood through the heart. The normal heart has two here. sides, a right um, side and a left side, and four chambers, the top here. receiving so chambers, atria, or atrium, and here, the lower the chambers, which are thick-walled right pumping chambers it's called ventricles. Red blood cell blood will come from pumping, either the superior vena cava so or the inferior vena cava and enter into, into the right here, atrium. The, the blood right then flows atrium. across the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. The right ventricle then squeezes and ejects that blood cell into a vessel called the pulmonary artery. And pulmonary artery splits into two vessels, trunk, each going to the, to the lungs. As that red blood cell makes its, its way through the lung, it returns the through the pulmonary veins the to the left the atrium. That blood is now oxygenated. Left. It's picked up oxygen, uh, then atria, goes across the mitral valve into the left ventricle, here, which does most of the work the in terms of delivery of blood flow to the body. That blood cell is now ejected here. into the aorta to some organ or muscle or skin in the human body. the rest of the body where it will feed you know the organs okay so that's a quick review of anatomy and then we're going to start with a case so this is Harold's case so Harold is a 54 year old man that has that possessed an ER with left-sided crushing chest pain shortness of breath and dizziness for the past three hours his chemistry labs show the troponin I is greater than 100 nanograms per mil the C case over 10,000 and CKMB is 598 all of those are extremely elevated so what do you think the diagnosis might be? Even if you just go by uh, his, present, his presentation and you're not sure what the lab tests mean, and then what do you think um, we need as other lab tests? Okay, so um, here are three choices, an acute a myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, and endocarditis. Um, all three of those uh, could possibly show elevations in those lab tests, but um, only really one will show incredibly high. Um, and that would be, it's going to be the acute myocardial infarction. So um, with the signs and symptoms presentation, uh, it matches the, the best acute MI, uh, so also known as a heart attack. Now, what lab test should, should be ordered? And really, when they come into the ER, all of these tests are ordered. But you want, basic, you want to baseline them for everything else because with... Um, these the labs that had the elevations in troponin ck and b and myoglobin uh, likely they need to take him to the cath lab right away and we want to have kind of idea of what else is going on with him so at at the minimum he's going to need to have a cbc a cmp comprehensive metabolic panel which would check you know his electrolytes kidney function glucose liver so we'll get kind of good overall picture of what's going on and then some coags to make sure that when they you know take him to the cath lab, he's not just going to bleed to death. Um, so those would be, you know, some baseline tests, bare minimum should be gotten. And usually, 
you know, I gave you the, the troponin results and all that. They're all done together when a, when a patient presents to the ER. Then we'll do the CBC, CMP, PT, PTT, and then a troponin. Uh, and then sometimes the CKB myoglobin along with it. Okay, so let's talk about myocardial infarction. So um, the most common cause of uh, myocardial infarction or a heart attack is the blockage of the coronary arteries. Uh, the coronary arteries are the first branches off of that main aorta, and they come off the main aorta and go right back to the heart itself, but they feed the heart muscle. So they, they, they are like a, sit like a crown around the heart, which is where the word coronary comes from. And they make sure that the heart muscle has plenty of, um, you know, energy. Um, so uh, it, you know, glucose and fatty acids and stuff that it can burn to make ATP. And that it has plenty of oxygen to do that. Okay, so, uh, so that it can, basically it needs oxygen and either glucose or fatty acids to produce ATP. It needs ATP to continue beating. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Although no lab test is 100% specific. Sorry, for the diagnosis of MI, uh, some uh, lab tests have been used for many years to aid in this diagnosis. And so this is kind of a flashback. So before we had the troponin, and I, I remember that becoming a new test when I was a new, a new tech, when I was a baby lab tech. Um, but before that, um, the physicians did uh, um, these other tests. So there was a CK an LDH and an AST enzyme level and a myoglobin level. And these were done, uh, and then you could follow up with a CK isoenzyme and an LD, um, LDH isoenzyme test also. So this is the old way of doing it, but it's been pretty much completely replaced by the troponin immunoassays and NCK and B immunoassays because they have much better sensitivity and specificity for um, myocardial infarctions and you know um, to detect problems here in the heart okay so let's talk a little bit about the coronary arteries again so these are the coronary arteries right here okay so they're feeding the heart muscle and arteries are portrayed in um, red in the veins in blue and if there is blockage a blocked artery then that would be um, the cause of a heart attack because what happens is then anything downstream of that artery then uh, there is going to suffer muscle damage and that muscle is going to start dying and is not able to contract which is what gives the chest pain because the heart is not efficient is not able to pump because that part that this part of the the muscle that's not no longer getting oxygen and nutrients is just not functioning at all okay and so the primary cause of this blocked artery is atherosclerosis and so this is what plaque buildup looks like and so you can see the lumen of the artery should be this big and then here it's only this big and this is plaque that has built up and so you can see it narrows faster and then the problem is if it becomes completely blocked or a clot lodges itself there and completely blocks it and then you have the muscle damage and of course uh, and we'll talk a little bit about intervention but the idea of what can we do for these patients is to try to one if it's not completely blocked try to dilate we give them medicine medications to dilate those arteries so that blood can flow through but then we also take them to the cath lab to try to open these up so we can restore blood flow to this heart muscle as soon as possible. Okay, so tell me, what are the signs and symptoms of an acute myocardial infarction? So some of those were exhibited by our patient. And so they were the classic chest pain. Sometimes people um, say it feels like somebody parked a truck on, on my chest or uh, an elephant sitting on my chest or some, something of the sort. Um, and shortness of breath. Um, and then they can have some, you know, some anxiety because of, you know, the, the chest pain and, and the not being able to breathe. Um, also, also often associated with it, it's going to be left arm pain, uh, even left jaw pain. Okay. And, and this is just because it's a common pathway um, of the nerve impulses through the heart. There's actually nothing wrong with the, with the arm itself, but um, because of the common pathway of the nerves, it goes by the heart. It, it's thinking your arm is hurting when it's actually your heart. Do um, You can see if um, patients can have what we call cold sweats. The medical term that for that is diaphoresis, diaphoretic um, sweats. And so um, they are cold and clammy and um, yeah they're you know, you know maybe a little shaky and um, females though can have unusual um, very unusual uh, signs and symptoms so um, they tend to 
not have the typical chest pain, but to have indigestion. And so um, an indigestion that just won't go away, especially if you take, if a, a female takes um, an antacid or something that should like take the pain, if it was truly heartburn, take that away and it doesn't go away, then um, that's a clue that it could be a heart related condition. Okay, next question then is, which one of these two words means the hardening of the arteries? A little medical terminology for you. Is it atherosclerosis or is it arteriosclerosis? Which one is it? Okay. So if you uh, looked at the lesson on the blood vessels disease, you will know that atherosclerosis is the building up of plaque in the artery and arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries. So the sclerosis means hardening, just the athero means the plaque, whereas this is just simply hardening of the arteries. So you could have arteriosclerosis or hardening of the arteries without having atherosclerosis, without having plaque there um, as possible, but they usually are present together. So um, I'm gonna play this one also for a second, just to show, this is just to show how um, muscle contracts. So they're gonna use skeletal muscle, but I want you to see all the things that are involved in heart muscle contraction. And I will also going to link muscle this Muscle contraction see the is at one. the basis of all the skeletal video movements. Down below. Skeletal okay, and so um, in a typical muscle, here you take a muscle fiber and break it down, and you see these little mild fibrils here, you're actin, Each sarcomere and, um, contains many parallel actin overlapping and filaments thin here. Actin, actin ones, and thick here's the myosin, myosin ones. filaments. So actin is thin, the myosin muscle contracts is thick, when okay? these filaments slide and this is how past each other, so it's the sliding resulting filament in a shortening of the sarcomere, and thus the muscle. This is known as the sliding filament or shortens the muscle. Um, the molecular you have, basis you have for this sliding muscle contraction, movement. and when they relax, muscle contraction muscle is initiated is when okay. muscle fibers this are stimulated by nerve impulse, nerve impulse and even in the cardiac, are released. cardiac one. So the nerve the impulse causes the release of the calcium. Calcium are comes bound and binds by calcium on ions. ions. The binding okay, displaces tropomyosin along the myofilaments, which in turn exposes the myosin binding sites. binding sites. At this stage, the head of each the, myosin little, unit is bound uh, to an ADP myosin, and a phosphate and, um, molecule they remaining have from the ADP previous muscular contraction. Linked, like, just basically a the myosin it with heads energy, release these phosphates and, then going and to bind let go to the actin myofilaments uh, via the newly exposed myosin binding sites. The two on myofilaments the glide myosin, past one uh, another, propelled on by a head-first movement of the myosin cool. units, powered and then, by the chemical uh, energy stored in their heads. It has to let As the go. units the only move, way they go release the ADP is molecules ADP bound to their heads. Comes the gliding motion is halted when it. ATP so molecules ATP, bind which to is the myosin again, why heads, you need thus severing the bonds between myosin and actin. The in, ATP uh, molecules relax, are now decomposed ATP into ADP and phosphate here, with the energy ADP released by this reaction stored in the myosin heads, ready to be used head, in the next cycle of movement. The myosin heads resume their so starting positions along the actin this is, I mean, this is showing it and can really now slow, begin a new sequence really of actin binding. The presence of further calcium ions will trigger a new cycle. Um, and so that's, again, ATP is needed um, for this, you know, muscle contraction to happen. And what do you need to make ATP? You need oxygen and nutrients. And there you go. That's how that happens. So then that leads me into troponins. So now you saw troponins. Troponin is a molecule on which calcium binds to rotate the actin filament so that uh, by rotating tropomyosin so that myosin can, can bind to it. So yes, you have troponin and all your skeletal muscles and all your muscles are some troponin. But you, what we have found is those molecules are of uh, troponin um, have some specificity. So the cardiac troponins have become the cardiac marker of choice for patients with acute coronary syndrome or um, you know, signs and symptoms of a heart attack. So the cardiac troponin is a protein complex. It's along the thin filament of the myofibrils, actin, that regulate the contra co contraction of cardiac muscle. Calcium binds the troponin to initiate that contraction. So that's the very beginning of muscle contraction, whether it's skeletal or cardiac. But here we're talking about cardiac. So up to 80% of patients with an acute MI will have an elevated troponin level within two to three hours of emergency department arrival. 
versus six to nine hours or more with a CKMB and other cardiac markers. So it rises um, faster. It rises faster, and uh, it's you know pretty diagnostic there of uh, a heart attack. And so of all the cardiac markers, again, the cardiac troponin is the most specific and sensitive. Troponin T and troponin I are both cardiac troponins. Um, in the, some labs do one or the other, but troponin I is used more frequently. Um, not saying it's better, uh, it's just that that one's the most frequently used um, than troponin T. So if you if your lab's running troponin T, then that's fine. That's, it's, it's also it's just as good to picking that up. Um, and so there are other troponins that are, um, you know, in the skeletal muscle, but we're not interested in those. Um, and so this is very specific for cardiac muscle. So it detects um, damage. And so basically the idea is where is the troponin, the cardiac troponin normally? It's just happily bound up here on its actin inside the heart muscle. But if there's that damage from the blockage and the heart muscle starts dying, um, the the these myofibrils get damaged and that protein gets released just like a, a damaged cell releases enzymes a damaged cell a damaged muscle cell is going to release enzymes but also uh, other proteins that are found in it and troponin is going to be one of them so it's going to break off of, of this and we can detect your troponin um, and basically, the, the higher the troponin level in the blood, the more significant the damage is to that heart muscle. So another test that can be done is CKMB. It is um, not done by all labs. Sometimes it's just done in the ER. Um, it really is kind of a preference of the physician. So again, CK, we talked about CK in the enzyme chapter, but it's found in the mitochondria and cytoplasm of skeletal muscle predominantly cardiac muscle, brain, and other visceral tissues. Total CK is non-specific for cardiac damage because remember, CK can be elevated with any kind of muscle damage. Okay, CK and B itself though is predominantly found in the myocardium, but it can also be found in small amounts in, in skeletal muscle, but it is predominantly, again, in the heart, in the, the heart muscle. It will rise four to six hours after the onset of chest pain will peak at 12 to 24 hours and um, clear pretty soon, just within a few days, okay? So unlike CK results, which are reported in um, units per liter, um, so measure of enzyme activity, CK and B are reported in nanograms per mil. And although the use of this test is diminishing and some institutions still use it, and some, some of its um, value is in the diagnosis of a reinfarction, so a second heart attack or second blockage. Uh, and in just a, a minute, when we get to a different slide, you'll see why that might be valuable. And then the third one that can be sometimes done part of the cardiac panel, again, totally depending on your physician preference and what's done in your area, is the myoglobin. So there are still some institutions that use myoglobin with the CKMB and the troponin to assist in the diagnosis of an acute MI. Uh, it is Another, it's another protein that's found in muscle. And so just like the troponin is released when it's damaged, the CK will be released, the CKMB will be released, and the myoglobin will be released. So we can detect all of them. It's just they vary in how fast they show up, how fast you can measure them, and how long they stick around, how fast it can be cleared by the kidneys. So um, myoglobin actually rises earlier than troponin or CKMB, uh, and it clears faster um, from the circulation. All right, so another little question to check our knowledge. Which is the best and most used cardiac marker to check for heart attacks? So if you're not sure, go back and actually give you the answers. The best and most used, this is the keyword, most used of these four. Okay, so here's a graph where I really wanted to kind of uh, address it. So um, now the ALT and the LDH, we don't really use those anymore. So we're just not gonna worry about those. But uh, so here, in this timeline, you have the patient actually has the heart attack, okay? So they're starting to experience the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. And hopefully they show up, they recognize that that's what's going on, and they get help and they show up to the ER pretty quickly. So within 
a few hours. Hopefully they, they're coming to the ER. Okay, so by the time they show up to the ER, so we're going to be somewhere over here. This is time, timed in days. Um, the troponin uh, could be um, rising, so it's here, the dotted line here. Okay, the CKMB could be rising. Here we go. A little bit after the troponin, but quite, quite early on also. And then the myoglobin actually is detectable first. And um, they're all going to rise up. Now, if they show up really, really early, like over here, it could be that the myoglobin is starting to be elevated, but the CKMB and troponin aren't elevated yet. But it's just, they're just being released. And so um, we're not you know, in the detectable window yet. And so, um, you know, depending on how the patient is presenting, they may yet take him to the cath lab, even if the troponin is negative, because they're having specific EKG changes and they're very clear indicator, indicators that this patient is having a heart attack and needs to go to the cath lab, even if the troponin is negative. If it's kind of one of those things, maybe he's having a heart attack, maybe he's not, or maybe she's having a heart attack, maybe she's not, then what they may do is simply, you know, um, give him supportive care right now in the ER, you know, give him some of the chest pain protocols, some oxygen, some nitro to dilate those arteries, and uh, a few things, um, you know, that are non-surgical, uh, and um, repeat the troponin a couple hours later to see if, it's, if it starts rising. Um, and <clears throat> then they can make the decision if they see that troponin start going up that yes, indeed, it's matching and we need to go ahead and get this patient to the cath lab. Okay. And so, um, you, you obviously they're going to get, the idea is to get the patient to the cath lab in like 20 to 30 minutes after the present, you know, and you've gotten an idea that they have, um, a heart attack, but it's really from, from the time they hit that ER door, they're supposed to be ideally in the cath lab within 20 to 30 minutes. Um, that's ideal. And then over time, um, as you know, they'll, they'll do the intervention, uh, these, these, these values are going to still be rising and they're going to peak, the troponin is going to peak at 24 to 48 hours and then it's going to start go down and it's going to take a week or two before it completely clears the circulation. There, so that's the thing where there's always going to be some remnant, okay? Whereas the myoglobin rises really quickly peaks at 12 to 24 hours and clears within 48 hours. CKMB peaks at 24, around here, 24 to 36 hours here, and then clears within a few days. So let's say that four or five, six days down the road, for some reason, this patient has a second heart attack while they're in the hospital even still. Um, this is where the myoglobin and CKMB could be useful because they've cleared and gone negative. So now if they start popping back up, then we can possibly diagnose a reinfarction. Uh, so a second heart attack or a second occlusion that happens. Or because the troponin won't be as much help because it would have gone down. Now, obviously, the troponin is going to eventually tick back up also, but the myoglobin and the CKMB can help you see that faster. Okay, so uh, CRP is another test that's useful. Now, this is not useful at all for a patient that's having a heart attack, okay? But the idea is we really don't want to wait until patients are having heart attacks uh, to, to start, you know, talking to them, to them about their heart and about heart health. And so um, what we're looking for are ways to detect atherosclerosis before um you know, a patient has a heart attack. And so uh, CRP is where this can um, be useful. So CRP is an acute phase reactant. It's synthesized by the liver in response to cytokines released by damaged tissue. It's, it's a marker of inflammation. It's very, very non-specific. So this is something you have to take into, um, in, you know, into account. So chronic inflammation is you know, a key, a key to heart disease. It's because of chronic inflammation that atherosclerosis and plaque develops. And it's it, 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 chronic inflammation can happen for years and years and years and years before an actual heart attack happens. And so um, with chronic inflammation, you will see elevated levels of C, CRP, C-reactive protein, especially if you do the high sensitivity of CRP. So it measures even lower amounts of, of this, but the, the, the key idea is um, if these are out of range uh, steadily, 
and especially if the patient doesn't have any other like overt sign that they're you know they're not like currently in have sinusitis or have the flu or they're not you know they're generally healthy you know feeling good and you know maybe they're coming for a checkup and you run a, a high sensitivity CRP and detect that they have chronic inf inflammation and they're not obviously sick and something's going on that's causing that chronic inflammation that needs to be, you know, we need to dig into. And so this basically, if you have, if you're otherwise healthy and uh, you don't have any other obvious inflammation going on and your high sensitivity CRP is elevated, then it could be mean that you have atherosclerosis that's developing. Uh, this can sometimes be referred to as a cardio CRP. And um, in patient with acute coronary disease, CRP levels predict mortality and cardiac complications. So basically the higher your CRP levels are, if you have acute coronary disease then, or having a heart attack, the worse your outcome is going to be. So, um, so that's, yeah, uh, high CRP levels point to a worse prognosis, meaning a worse outcome, a, a lesser chance of surviving for people that are having acute coronary syndromes, meaning having a heart attack. Uh, but remember, again, CRP rises with any kind of inflammation and it's not specific to the heart. Okay, so again, if you're just coming off of a rip-roaring case of the flu or of coronavirus, or your CRP is going to be elevated. Okay, so what can cause an increase in inflammation that could lead to cardiovascular disease? So... If you are not sure, go back and review the lipid chapter. So, or you can just try, you know, Google it and just think about it. So what are things that can cause this chronic inflammation that can lead to cardiovascular disease? So I want you to think about that and list different conditions. If you're on, um, just on YouTube, um, go in the direction of what causes chronic inflammation to think about that because those are all, all the conditions that chronic cause chronic inflammation or conditions that are going to potentially lead to cardiovascular disease. Okay, so other diagnostic tools that can be used uh, to assess the heart. So um, EKG, so it's written ECG, sometimes E with a KG, and sometimes ECG, EKG. It kind of depends on which part of the country you live in. Uh, so it's a graphic depiction of the electrical activity of the heart. Uh, any disruption in this activity can be detected as soon as it occurs. This is actually the first test that, uh, that will be done to the patient when they show up to the ER or um, you know they first assess for chest pain because this it just requires putting the leads on the patient. It takes about 30 seconds to get a reading. It takes probably a couple minutes at least to place the lead so you can very quickly get an assessment of what's going on. And um, the computers that are associated with these EKGs can actually interpret the, um, the rhythms. And if there is um, a suspect of a heart attack, it will say uh, in, in big letters, acute coronary syndrome, heart attack, something so that, um, you know, you, the, the nurse that is doing it or um, detect that's doing that EKG can actually alert the physician right away. And then the physician can look at it himself and decide what's going on. Um, echocardiogram, so that's echo, it's a sonography, right? Um, it checks the heart's ability to pump blood, so it checks it, you know, real time. Uh, it, it views the, the um, atria and ventricles contracting and how blood is moving through um, the valves. Um, echocardiograms, for example, could um, pick up leaking valves, um, and so those can be quite useful. Also, of course, simply a chest x-ray will at least detect the size of the heart. Uh, or and see if there's fluid around the heart. So if there's a heart that's enlarged, uh, that can be just picked up on a chest x-ray. And then the angiogram uh, is what is done in the cath lab. Um, and so it's a picture of the vessels. Specifically here is coronary angiogram. So um, we get a picture of the, the vessels of the, you know, the coronary arteries and to detect blockages in the coronary arteries. Now, obviously, you can get angiograms of any area of the body, but since we're in the heart chakra, we're talking about uh, the coronary arteries, getting a picture of them. And so here's, uh, again, a, an EKG. It doesn't show like all the leads, but leads are placed uh, around the body. And then these are uh, the reading of all the electrical impulses that are coming through. And uh, the basic breakdown is um, it corresponds to the electrical impulse that's going through the heart. So the P wave is atrial depolarization. So it's the electrical impulse going through the atria. And then the atria starts contracting. 
And then uh, the impulse is slightly delayed and then it reaches the ventricles. And uh, so it flows through the ventricles. And as the electrical impulse flows through the ventricles and the ventricles begin to contract. So the part where the electrical impulse flows through the ventricles is the QRS complex. And then um, the T wave here is when it repolarizes. Now there is a repolarization of these atrial um, nerves, this atrial section, but it's hidden over here and you usually can't pick it up. So you have, you know, uh, atrial depolarization, the heart, uh, the atria contracts, ventricular depolarization, ventricular ventricles contract, and then everything repolarizes, which then means and when depolarization and repolarization have to do with your sodium and potassium switching places in the nerves for the imp nerve impulse to go through. Uh, everybody's got to go back to where they belong. Um, and then so that the next uh, cardiac cycle can begin, the next impulse, you know, can be um, sent from, and this is sent, uh, started by the sinoatrial node, or a, a SA node, which is the pacemaker of the heart. Um, for every one of these um, that happens is one cardiac cycle, so that means a, a the atria contract, the ventricles contract, and then everything relaxes, and then another one. So this is one heartbeat. And if you measure this on an EKG strip, this is one second time. So if you get a 60 second strip and count all of these, you have their heart rate number of heartbeats per 60 seconds. So. But uh, the, what this looks like can give you a lot of information on what's going on with the heart. A little bit beyond all I said here. Now the other one here I'm going to um, play. Um, so this is a coronary angiography with balloon placement. And so they're, they're putting a dye, okay? And the dye is showing the coronary arteries. And um, this is left anterior descending artery. And... Um, of the heart, here we go, and it's showing, so as the heart, you can see the heart pumping, and circumflex artery, and anterior descending artery, and there. And so if there's a blockage, what's going to happen is um, that dye won't be able to pass through. Uh, and so here you can see a narrowed, is showing a narrowed diameter, so you can see any kind of narrowing in the vessels. Uh, and you can see complete uh, blockages also. Anyway, so for example, this one uh, as it in, can take pictures as this happens. So this one here shows partial blockage. So you can see the dyes coming through here. And so this is a good opening. And then this is where the plaque has built up. And so we have a partial blockage, but it still goes through. But this is an area of concern. And then this is if it if it stops, then there's a full blockage. Um, so anyway, so this is a way to get pictures and see what, how many blockages are going on. And then they can do, uh, for interventions, they can do uh, stents, balloons and stents. So balloons is where they, they, they go with the same uh, wire that had, uh, where they were given to die. They can float a, basically this little deflated balloon that goes into a partial blockage. You can't use balloons for full blockage. You're going to put it in here and then inflate it and it just kind of pushes it open and then the stent is a, a little metal um, mesh, it's not really metal, it's mesh device that uh, kind of like a Chinese finger trap if you play with it and just props open and once it props open it stays open uh, so and obviously fit for the diameter of that artery you, so once you've like pushed the things open with a balloon you go put the stent in there and it opens up and so you restore blood flow there uh, to pa pass that blockage. And so those are stents. And so if somebody says they've had four stents, that means they've, they had four of these partial blockages that were opened up and a uh, stent placed in there. If you have a full blockage though, then uh, the, the you cannot do stents. Then you have to do a bypass graft. So basically you have to route the blood from here to beyond the blockage. So you have to give it an alternate route uh, by grafting an artery. Uh, from from before the blockage to after the blockage. Okay, so um, moving on to congestive heart failure, also referred to as CHF. Um, and um, when patients experience heart failure, what what we're referring to is really your your pump, your heart as a pump is not pumping efficiently. 
This can happen after a heart attack that has led to significant damage of the, of the uh, heart muscle because uh, heart muscle that has been damaged, if there's been some necrosis, uh, that tissue turns into scar tissue and scar tissue doesn't pump. And so uh, sometimes people after a heart attack, they lose part of the pumping ability of the heart and then the heart is only, instead of working at 100% capacity, maybe it's only uh, working at 50% capacity. Okay, and that causes, because it's not pumping efficiently the blood, there's a backup of uh, a fluid buildup. Um, and so um, that fluid buildup will cause a characteristic shortness of breath, fatigue, so they get tired very easily, and peripheral edema, so this is usually swelling on the lower extremities, ankles, legs, etc. And it's because your heart's not circulating blood, so it is not generating good pressure, which means that it's having a hard time pulling fluid back to itself. And so that fluid is staying in the tissues um, and there's not enough in the circulation. And so um, this dysfunction is again, often associated with coronary artery disease, but also chronic hypertension, so chronic high blood pressure, uh, valvular heart diseases, so somebody has a mitral valve stenosis or something like that, and other cardiomyopathy. So anything that can damage your heart in any kind of way can lead to congestive heart failure. The diagnosis of congestive heart failure can be difficult because the symptoms are very nonspecific. Again, tiredness, you know, a little fluid retention, shortness of breath, very nonspecific. So an echocardiogram is often used. Uh, it would show an enlarged heart. Um, a chest radiograph could show the enlarged heart and also maybe the fluid around the heart that's uh, been accumulating. So this little video shows, again, I'll link it A healthy below. heart, as seen here, um, beats approximately 60 so to 100 a times a minute, heart. providing oxygen-rich okay, blood so to the rest of the body. The lower uh, left chamber of the heart, called body. the left ventricle, um, is the main you pumping know, chamber. Left there are many different heart, conditions that can lead is, to congestive again, heart failure, the one that including the most a prior heart attack, comes to high blood pressure, body, and coronary artery right disease. Heart Any of these can prevent the and, heart from efficiently um, pumping blood to the rest of the body. Because it doesn't pump, they as a result, the, the heart may beat faster, and, and the ventricle may increase in size, becoming an even less to, effective pump. Uh, when the, the kidneys sense the reduced blood flow, they attempt to compensate by retaining more water and salt. And because it's not good at pumping, excess fluid retention. Often causes uh, congestion in the tissues blood, and results in swelling and an increased blood, strain on an already weak heart. There's not enough the volume, progressive effect so of the heart failing to properly to, circulate blood. Um, sorry, I meant to pause the video, not the recording. So if the kidneys aren't getting enough blood, uh, it thinks that you're dehydrated, that you don't have any, any enough blood fluid. And so what it does is then it causes you to retain fluid to try to up the volume, but there's already a fluid overload um, around the heart and in other parts of the body. And so it just makes it worse. Um, and so it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a congestive heart failure. It's a problem of fluid balance and a defective heart pump. And so um, we are going to go here into uh, how we diagnose it. So again, due to poor circulation associated with congestive heart failure, then patients will often have abnormal kidney function. Uh, the B-type or brain-type natriuretic pe peptide, also known as the BNP, not to be confused with the BMP, which is the basic metabolic panel, is uh, it's one of three uh, natriuretic peptides. So there's BNP, ANP, and CNP, so A, B, and um, C-type natriuretic peptide. And those natriuretic peptides they regulate blood pressure, electrolyte balance, and fluid volume, but basically they're a signal that you have too much volume, uh, that your heart is getting too much, um, there's too much volume fluid, and it needs to um, dump fluid, okay? So it's produced primarily by the ventricle, um, especially the left ventricle, in response to pressure and stretch. So this is basically how much, how much that ventricle is filling so the pressure of the fluid and the stretch of the muscle, okay? And it functions to counteract va the vasoconstrictive effects of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So the natriuretic peptide system and the RAS system are opposite to each other, okay? The RAS will make you accumulate fluid and the 
the natriuretic peptides will make you dump fluid. And the thing is, what's happening is your body, your kidneys think that you're dehydrated, you don't have enough, and so they activate this, but the heart's activating the the the, the other side, the natriuretic peptide, and so there's there's a problem there. Um, and so um, the RRAS is a system will increase blood pressure and retain salt in water. Um, and so you can see how that can feed into the problem of congestive heart failure. So we can detect this BNP, this brain type you know, natriuretic peptide, and um, they're available on many amino acid analyzers. Once drawn, the specimen has to be separated from the cells within four hours in the plasma, which is usually EDTA, refrigerated. Most of the time, if these are ER patients, the samples are just tested right away. Uh, and so uh, an elevated BNP, then brain type natriuretic peptide, is indicative of congestive heart failure. Okay, so what was one sign of congestive heart failure and what is the test to screen for it? So again, quick little recall, if you're not sure, just rewind it. Okay, so then moving on to congenital heart defects. So congenital meaning this is something that a baby is born with. This is something that you're born with, okay? So there are malformations of the heart. The heart is formed really early on. A lot of times the heart is being formed before women even know that they're pregnant. And so um, this can cause issues if they're on certain medications that they're taking. Um, and it can be just over-the-counter medicines, okay? So let's talk about some of the main congenital heart defects. So uh, septal defects are abnormal openings in the septum. The septum is a wall that separates the right and left side of the heart, and it should be a solid wall completely intact, okay? So um, if you have, if there is a hole between the two atria, that's an atrial septal defect, and then what happens is, the blood from uh, the left side can mix with the right side and vice versa. If it's the hole is in the, on the ventricle uh, end of, it, of the wall, then it's a ventricular septal defect. And again, you can have blood mixing from the right and the left side. Of course, the problem here is if you have that hole, and this is often to ha referred to as having a hole in the heart, okay? You're not squirting blood out, uh, you know, in your chest cavity. You just, it's getting mixed. And so ideally, you know, your unoxygenated blood that's headed to the lungs just goes to the lungs and it comes back oxygenated and it goes to the rest of your body. But if you have a hole here, what's happening is this oxygenated blood, instead of going to the rest of the body, then is going for another ride to the lungs. And so that's very inefficient. Uh, and um, usually it goes from left to right, but it can go from right to left depending on the, the pressures and stuff like that. But either way, that means that this unoxygenated blood then could be sneaking over to the left side instead of going to the lungs without any kind of oxygen. Either way, it's not very helpful for the heart to have, especially this um, ventricular um, septal defects. And sometimes there can be several of them. Uh, signs and symptoms will depend on the size of the holes, um, so how, how big the defects are. So. They are usually diagnosed and usually using a combination of echocardiograms, um, EKGs, and chest radiography. Small septal defects can close on their own. So sometimes if it's not really bothering the baby or it's just, it, it, they say they'll outgrow it. It should close with time. But um, they often need to be surgically repaired. But they can do this with VI catheterization. So they can insert a catheter you know, and come in through one of the main arteries here and then go and fix, you know, fix it here. So they can do catheterization and, and fix this hole here um, and patch it up. And sometimes uh, it, this may not even be detected till they hit some growth spurts in their teen years uh, if, if the holes aren't really big, but they never closed. So another one that's um, seen is the Tetralogy of Fallot. Um, and so it's four cardiac, cardiac abnormalities, that's where it's a tetra, tetra means four, and they are associated oftentimes with Down syndrome and Edwards syndrome, so with some other genetic deficiencies uh, or abnormalities. So um, they are at risk of, high, of having hypercyanotic spells, meaning they turn blue 
all of a sudden, uh, and the only true treatment is started. So what's going on with the heart in the tetralogy of phallic is, okay, first of all, um, there's pulmonary stenosis, meaning the pulmonary artery opening here uh, with the semilunar valve is narrowed, okay, it's narrower than it needs to be. And because it's narrower than it needs to be, the right side of the heart is having a hard time pumping the whole, all the contents of the right ventricle into that pulmonary trunk to go to the lungs. And so it's constantly pushing against this narrowed opening to try to get that blood in there. And so that then would lead to right ventricular hypertrophy that this, uh, as a response to tr constantly trying to push this blood hard into this narrowed artery, then this wall is going to get thicker trying to push it, which also means there's less room for the blood to come in. Okay, so that's one response there. Then the other two abnormalities is you're going to see an overriding aorta and a ventricular septal defect. So because of the hole in uh, the ventricular wall, this aorta, um, the opening of the aorta is kind of shifted where you can see it's capturing, um, not only is the, 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 the blood mixing right and left side, so oxygenated and unoxygenated blood are being mixed, but the way this aorta is overriding it basically when the ventricles pump is is capturing oxygenated and unoxygenated blood from you know from both sides um again not a very efficient pump and they have to go and fix that surg surgically we need to close all of that and open up and do it as soon as possible and then the other one this is this can be deadly if not caught right away um and even if it's uh caught like if the the baby is not at a hospital that can do this type of intervention, which typically are children's hospital with a, a, car, a pediatric cardiologist that can do this, um, as you know, right after they're born, a lot of times they don't. It's hard for them to survive long enough to get to where they can have the surgery. But what happens is, is a transmission transposition of the great arteries. So the two main arteries are inverted. So what happens is, your your right side of the heart that's supposed to be pumping to the lungs are pumping to is pu pumping unoxygenated blood into your main aorta and back to the rest of your body the body and the baby's body and the left side of the heart is supposed to be pumping oxygenated blood is uh, pumping to the lungs so um part of what is going on so why they can survive for a little bit is there are a few uh, modifications that are present from the fetus and so there is normally an, an, a hole in between the, 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 uh, the foramen ovale between the two atria, and there is a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And these um, adaptations are there because when a baby is in the womb, there's no need for the blood to go to the lungs because there's what's in the lungs is amniotic fluid. Where's the baby getting oxygen? It's getting oxygen from the placenta. And so the circulation of the heart is a little bit different. Uh, and so basically it's getting a mix of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood on the right side and it doesn't really need to pump it to the, to, to the lungs. And so it has a shortcut so it can go here, you know, jump atria and then go out. Or um, normally, if it's entering, should be entering the pulmonary artery, it can also just jump over to the aorta. And so these will keep it alive for just a short time. But what happens is those really start closing pretty shortly after birth. Um, this, uh, the hole between um, the atria starts closing in this, uh, it's called patent ductus arteriosus adaptation should also be closing. And so you have to fix that right away and you have to flip them back the way they're supposed to be. So this little guy needs to go over here. This little guy needs to go over there. Um, and I will tell you this, I didn't learn this till a few years ago. There's a very common over-the-counter medication that can cause this this transposition of the great arteries, and it's something you probably have taken, and it's ibuprofen. So in all of its off-brand, you know, uh, its relatives and stuff. And so, you know, it's very possible for, for somebody to take that early on in pregnancy before they even know that they're pregnant, and, and this cause problems with the formation of the baby's heart.
Next, we're going to talk about endocarditis. Mm -hmm. So it is an infection of the inner layer of the heart. That's the layer of the heart that's in contact with the blood that's rushing by. The signs and symptoms are really vague, but basically there, there are fever and chills, um, usually, but malaise, so you don't feel good. There's some weight loss, shortness of breath. All of those are fairly common. Not a characteristic chest pain or anything like that. Common infectious agents that can cause endocarditis are strep viridin, staph aureus, and enterococcus species, and they would be coming from a skin, a skin wound that's not well treated or transient bacteremia from the mouth. So, and a patient that has really bad gum disease and bleeding gums, anytime the gums are made to bleed, so it could be post-dental procedure, some of that bacteria from the mouth can enter the bloodstream and, some, and could settle in the heart and cause endocarditis. Patients that are at a higher risk of endocarditis are going to be congestive heart failure patients, uh, patients that have heart valve issues, and any patient that's had a previous cardiac damage, um, which is, again, very important to give your uh, medical history to your dentist because then they may choose to prophylactically treat you with an antibody, um, antibiotic uh, to prevent you from getting endocarditis and uh, try to get ahead of that. Uh, it's diagnosed with blood cultures taken from two separate sites and them being positive. Uh, and we also do troponin myoglobin levels, but you would not expect to see that, that sharp increase like you do, uh, sharp rise and fall like you do in a acute heart attack, but because it's causing stress and inflammation, you might would see just a steady kind of uh, elevation, but it, it's not, there's not a, a, a rise and a decrease, it's just kind of just steady. So again, a quick review of anatomy, if you took a cut a chunk out of the heart, look, you have, this is the endocardium, so endocarditis is infection of this layer, this is the myocardium, we're going to talk about myocarditis, so this is where the muscle, heart muscle is. And then uh, your pericardial cavity and parietal pericardium and uh, visceral pericardium, which is also known as the epicardium. So this is the outer layer, and this can also get um, inflamed or infected. So myocarditis is inflammation of the myocardium from chronic infections. So this can be caused, obviously, infectious agents, but also autoimmune processes, drugs, chemicals, and physical agents can all cause it. it. The infection could be bacterial, viral, or fungal. Uh, either way, whatever, whatever the process, what happens is the lymphocytes uh, are invade the myocardium and cause damage. Typical triggers of myocarditis are going to be penicillin, sulfonamides, and cocaine as for the drugs, and inflammatory diseases such as, for example, lupus, RA, and other autoimmune diseases. Pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium, so that's the sac around the heart. Chest pain is a cardinal symptom of pericarditis. It can be acute or chronic. Uh, I mean, acute meaning you just get um, one episode of it in short term and you recover. Chronic means you have chronic issues with it. It goes on for months or years. Um, the underlying conditions that can cause pericarditis are an acute MI, trauma, especially trauma to the heart, but just trauma. Uh, a fungal or viral infection, metastatic cancer, autoimmune diseases, and some of the heart drugs. The potential co complications of pericarditis is cardiac tamponade, which is due to the is compression of heart from the fluid that has accumulated in that pericardial sac, um, it, which that is often associated with a malignancy. So cancers, malignancies can cause fluid accumulation in the body, such as ascites in the abdomen, but also uh, pleuritis, pericarditis. Um, so infusions are caused by tumors. They often lead to bleeding and also in fluid accumulations. Um, another potential complication, of course, of acute pericarditis is chronic pericarditis and pericardial effusion also. So again, uh, fluid staying around the heart. So how do you diagnose these? So endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis can be difficult to diagnose. A variety of tests as well as a thorough physical exam and history are needed. Uh, if the inflammation is due to an infection, obviously a blood culture and CDC are going to be helpful. Um, it may be uh, some of the an antibody testing for certain, um, um, te for certain infections. So uh, if the condition could be due to a past infection, so this is where you would look for antibodies to CMV, Epstein-Barr, or other path path pathogens, so looking for antibody titers to those. 
Imaging studies can also detect the physical abnormalities that can assist your diagnosis or can you know, show that fluid accumulation of where, where it is or the swelling or inflammation of, um, of the heart wall. And so this is a, if you're in my Nearpod, you can do the little matchy activity there. And otherwise that's it. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them uh, in a Nearpod. If you're in my class, you can drop them below if you are on YouTube and I thank you for your attention.